three white men who had founded the company and just discrimination wasn't even something that that kind of entered their consciousness on a day-to-day -day basis but actually that's a problem and it's a problem that uh, that they didn't have other stakeholders thinking about this it's a problem that they made design choices that were allowing discrimination on the platform and it's a problem that they weren't tracking the potential for it and then proactively trying to address it Today, we're talking with Mike Luca. Mike is the Lee J. Steislinger III Associate Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School, where he teaches a course called From Data to Decisions, The Role of Experiments, which looks at the rise of experiments in organizations. And his research focuses on online platforms and how data from those platforms can inform managerial and policy decision making. So thank you so much for joining us today, Mike. Thanks for having me. Good to see you again, Mike. All right, let's 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 start with um, sort of a big umbrella question, Mike. From your work, what are the biggest points that stand out for you where technology treats people differently? So it's a great question. So this is a topic, it's a broad topic. It's a topic I've been working on for a number of years now. And maybe one thing we could do is just take a little bit of a step back and think about like the history of how the internet has evolved and actually how people think about the internet has evolved. Yeah, when I started at HBS, it was 2011. Yeah, the very first case study I had written was on Airbnb. And I'd written the case study, and actually I wasn't teaching in the first semester, but was invited to give a guest lecture talking about Airbnb. Now, at the time, people were still thinking about what are platforms like this doing, uh, what's their scope in the economy going to be, and people hadn't thought at all about the potential for inequality on platforms and how that might trickle through the economy in what turned out to be important ways. So I had taught the class, and I remember at the time, asking, you know, if you were a landlord on Airbnb, should you have the right to reject guests? And a lot of people at the time thought, kind of, yeah, it seems obvious that you should just have the ability to have discretion. You kind of run whatever, renting out your apartment, renting out a house, renting out a handful of uh, listings. But then I sort of would flip the question and say, what if you're a Marriott? Should you have the right to reject guests who are coming in and looking for a place to stay? And pretty quickly, the difference between the system in which people are used to making bookings look quite different in an important but subtle way uh, than new platforms like Airbnb and other platforms that similar design choices at the time. Um, I had gone into that case study really thinking about the design of reputation systems and how you build trust on a platform like Airbnb. Uh, but through the writing of it, it became clear to me that when you look at a platform like Airbnb, they weren't giving that much information for a host to decide whether or not to accept a guest. You basically saw a picture of the person, a name of the person, and not that much else. And I started thinking, you know, what is a host going to use when deciding whether to accept or reject a guest? And it struck me that there was a, a possibility that this is going to give rise to discrimination in an industry that worked hard for decades to try to get rid of discrimination in hotels, in housing, in apartment rentals. Have you done any work to look at um, the patterns of discrimination? Does it match to what we see in traditional sort of brick and mortar business, is it similar or are there just unique qualities that are just totally unique to online platforms? So one area where I've kind of tried to push in my research is thinking about the role of design choices in platforms and how they could lead to more or less discrimination in an ecosystem. So to put that into context a little bit, there have been earlier work about uh, discrimination on the internet that have looked around the early 2000s, late 1990s, and posited that the rise of online platforms might actually lead to less discrimination in uh, society. And the argument was, instead of making purchases face-to-face, -face, where you're seeing all these markers of race, gender, and whatnot, um, that give rise to discrimination in real life transactions, you're taking away some of that and creating more arm's length transactions, where you're essentially replacing a human-to-human -human purchase with something where you're just looking at a reputation score or a rating and then deciding whether or not to buy something. So there was some early evidence on that. And at the time, people were really treating this as just the evolution of how things might happen in the online ecosystem. And I think where we stepped in is to actually say two, two things. One, it's not necessarily true that that's how we should expect the internet to evolve. If you look at the first generation of online platforms, it kind of looked like things were going to be more anonymous. 
But if you look at later platforms like the Airbnbs of the world, you know, they started to actually get rid of a lot of that anonymity and pride themselves on reducing social distance by just giving you lots of information, not only about the product, but about the person you're uh, transacting with. So the first point we raised was essentially that we could expect the possibility of discrimination even if early work in more anonymous online transactions suggests that there may be less. And the second point we made, which is can perhaps the more important one for our platforms to think about, is that there are a lot of design choices they are making that are going to either lead to more discrimination or less discrimination. So take Airbnb. We actually, kind of after this case study, set out and ran a pair of uh, academic studies following the case study to look at the potential for discrimination in the platform. And to give a sense of the type of work we're doing, we ran a large scale audit study. It essentially looks like what some people had done um, in, in offline rentals in past decades. But now we took this online and essentially sent out requests to stay with different hosts. So we sent out 6,400 requests. And the only thing we buried in our request was the name. And for the names, we chose names that were statistically more likely to be African-American guests and statistically more likely to be white guests. And this is following a uh, labor market audit study methodology people had done. Um, so taking that, we sent out these requests. And what we found is that African-American guests were about 16% less likely to be accepted relative to white guests um, on Airbnb. Now, we could take this result and kind of say, is that more or less? One comparison you can make is just compare it to going on to Expedia or, or Orbitz, where there's not really scope for this type of discrimination. And essentially, you're taking a market where if I go and try to rent a place through Orbitz, there's not going to be discrimination based on my name. And maybe there will be discrimination when I show up at the hotel. But you've taken out a large chunk through the design choices that Orbitz has made. You don't have a manager deciding whether or not a, trust, a guest seems trustworthy. Um, in contrast, Airbnb both gave this information about your name and your, uh, your identity and also gave you discretion to accept or reject based on that with little other information. So I would say that there, you're essentially unraveling some of the changes that have led to less discrimination previously. I want to talk a little bit about design because um, you looked at this issue quite early on. I mean, you mentioned you, the class you were teaching in, in 2011. Where is it that design, where were companies thinking about um, design back when you looked at this? And have you seen that evolve? Like, is there a huge emphasis on design and the impact that can have? Um, or, is it, or is it not evolving in technology, like the advances in technology are still dominating? Do you have a sense of that? Uh, Ray Fisman and I um, put together an HBR article and I had had a series of conversations with Airbnb and other platforms and some of these policymakers about what kinds of design choices might you make? And when we think about Airbnb, an example of the type of thing that you could do is decide how hard or easy it is to reject a guest. Do you penalize a host who rejects a lot of guests, and especially a host who systematically rejects African-American guests, but not white guests, right? So that's kind of one type of design choice. And you might say, oh, does Airbnb really dictate that? Because I think early on, one of the big questions people would have is, is this just reflecting society or is this reflecting Airbnb's design choices? But there's a pretty interesting history of Airbnb design choices on that. So much earlier, so around 2011, when we wrote this first case study, Airbnb at the time was thinking about how much of a penalty do you put on hosts for rejecting guests? And initially they had strong penalties because they wanted to make sure that hosts were committing to let people stay with them and that you had uh, reduced what a market designer would think about congestion on the platform, essentially make it easy for me as a guest to go on and find a booking. But after some negative incidents that hosts had had, in particular, there was, um, you may remember an article by, uh, by a, a blogger named EJ, kind of nicknamed EJ, who had rented out her place and had the place trashed and had trouble navigating Airbnb system. So following that, Airbnb essentially said, let's make it a lot easier for people to reject guests. And essentially said, you should feel free to reject guests for any reason, just so that you could feel comfortable. And uh, over time, that penalty has gone back and forth. And the point that we made is that you shouldn't just be thinking about market thickness and congestion there. You should also be thinking about the implications that that has for discrimination. And without measuring that and thinking explicitly about it, you're not going to be able to know what the impact on final levels of discrimination are. So that's kind of one type, one example of design choices. 
Yeah, this is this has been a theme across a number of our conversations um, where, you know, technology companies are technology companies first and they think, what are we doing to sort of enable the platform to run the platform? What are the technology choices we make to um, build up this system and make it run? And in the past and even in the present, less so what's the impact on people, our users, society. And a lot of um, companies, especially early in startup, you know, they're dominated by engineers building, not social scientists or um, product managers that are so focused on, um, on the impact to customers beyond just using the product. So this is, this is actually a theme that comes up over and over again in our conversations. And I imagine it's something that um, companies have evolved to think about a lot more now. Yeah, so the problem wasn't that there was no malicious player at Airbnb who was thinking, let's facilitate widespread discrimination. It was more that they didn't think about it at all. And this is just a blind spot that they had when designing the product. And in fact, when addressing our research afterwards, the CEO had made this a priority um, for the company to address discrimination and said, look, we were three, the way he had said it was that they were three white men who had founded the company and just discrimination wasn't even something that that kind of entered their consciousness on a day-to-day -day basis. But actually that's a problem. And it's a problem that, uh, that they didn't have other stakeholders thinking about this. It's a problem that they made design choices that were allowing discrimination on the platform. And it's a problem that they weren't tracking the potential for it and then proactively trying to address it. So then kind of in the wake of this second paper, um, they, they started acknowledging some of these problems and thinking, all right, now what do we do? How do we move forward? You know, I think we've all heard a lot at this point about um, when uh, organizations try to mitigate discrimination or prevent it, right, or sort of reduce bias, they sometimes end up either not having an effect, um, right, and sort of missing the mark, um, and just in the bias kind of continues to uh, to be there to be embedded, or they actually exacerbate it. So um, I'm just curious, you know, as you said, you have a kind of uh, you know, a, a take about what are the ways to think about those choices. And so I'm, I'm just curious, you know, if you could maybe um, talk a little bit more about, you know, how is it that companies, you know, can avoid just inadvertently either perpetuating and exacerbating these, these problems when, you know, when they have the good intentions of um, working, to, working to mitigate them. So we could separate this into a couple of issues. First, do companies have the right incentives to get rid of bias? And that's an important policy question. It's an important managerial question uh, to start to think about. To some extent, when thinking about Airbnb's position and other platforms, so after our research, they had to grapple with, you know, are we going to reduce discrimination? And if so, is that going to change the profitability of the company? And in cases where they could find uh, something that both increased profitability and reduced discrimination, those decisions were clear in situations where they would say, okay, we could cut half of discrimination, but this is also going to start to nibble into our profits at the margin, then they need to make decisions about, are we going to take those hard steps and hope that in the long run that that's going to pay off um, in a more inclusive product that appeals to a broader base of users. So then when we see companies that are making decisions that aren't that effective, we should at least ask the question, are they doing that because they didn't know what would work? Or are they doing that because the things that were work were viewed to be too costly for them in some sense, at least in the short run? So I could give a concrete example of that. In the case of Airbnb, a couple of, they did adopt a lot of the things that we had suggested. And one of the more interesting changes, I think, is that they created a team of people to look at discrimination on an ongoing basis, understanding that this isn't going to solve the whole problem in one you know, in one set of changes that it's gonna be something that they need to be thinking about on an ongoing basis. And once you have that infrastructure, there are a lot of things that you could think about doing. Now, when you look at those changes, was that enough? Now, if you look over time, they've increasingly taken more steps. And for people I've spoken with at Airbnb, there are very well-intentioned people who are working hard to try to figure out how to get rid of discrimination on the platform. So now we can think about how do you know if something worked? You make this change, you think it worked, you read a paper that suggests this type of thing might be effective. And this is where I think tracking and evaluating via experiments or other empirical methods is super important for companies to be thinking about. 
I would imagine that there's probably always some portion of users, right, that are quite committed to their biases, right, and will pay the cost, right, to say, like, not, you know, rent to um, an African American guest, right, you know, even if it's, you know, they get, they're penalized for it. So I'm just really curious, like, what you think about, do companies sort of have a responsibility to keep those people actually out of the platform, or, you know, is it okay for them to think about them as just kind of, there uh, the a cost of a discrimination cost of doing business right to sort of say well we know those people can't the design choices can't fully eliminate that those type of actions and we're gonna let those people in and just accept a minimum you know a minimum amount of discrimination or do companies have a responsibility to say how can we keep those users fully out of the platform i'm just curious what you think about that so i have my own personal beliefs about discrimination in platforms but when i step back from that and think about the frameworks that managers can adopt it's thinking about what are the legal rules around whether or not you could allow discrimination on the platform now what are the ethical uh, guidelines you'll follow so how do you personally feel about running a platform that's facilitating discrimination and the third which sometimes gets overlooked is how customers and employees are going to feel about uh, visiting a platform that's knowingly facilitating discrimination and allowing people to discriminate who they could just take off the platform and it's they're never going to get rid of it's going to be hard to get rid of all the discrimination on the platform but when you get to a point where you know that there are discriminators on there and you just say look we know that they discriminate but it's profitable for us that's pretty tough medicine to ask all of your other customers to take and for all of your employees to take. So after we had this paper and once everybody kind of agreed that there was discrimination on Airbnb, um, they got to a point where employees or a lot of employees wanted uh, the company to do something about it. And a lot of customers wanted people to do something about it. And that is part of the pressure that could help to uh, induce change on these platforms. We did want to get into this a little bit, and then you've talked about this already with some specific examples, but you actually wrote a book with um, a colleague at, at Harvard Business School about experiments and the role of experiments in organizations today. And so just wanted to hear you talk a little bit about um, what exactly is it that experiments can do in helping us to identify and address discrimination. So it turns out experiments play an important role in helping to address discrimination. We could talk a little bit about the motivation for this book and how we started thinking about the issue more broadly. So um, I've been working for years with my colleague, Max Pazerman. Um, now he's a psychologist, I'm an economist. He kind of came at this from the web and thinking about how to take those things out into policy. I came about this thinking about the design of platforms and the role experiments could play there. And um, we had co-taught a course called Behavioral Insights, um, where we had taken students to work on behavioral projects in government. Think about how can you use insights to help improve uh, the social good. And we started thinking about like how important experiments were there in terms of knowing whether or not something would actually work. And you know, we started thinking about it in both the government sector and in the tech sector. And we came together and I thought, look, there's a lot of value that experiments could create in organizations. And we wanted to help managers to think about the fact that managers also have to be thinking about experiments. I think you know, in the tech sector, experiments have been common for a long time now. Yeah, but one of the things that we had noticed over the years is that a lot of times, similar to design choices, they would be left as kind of, oh, this is just a decision that gets made in the course of project, in a project. Of course, we have an A-B testing system, yeah, but they sort of outsource the thinking on it. And one of the things we realized is that this leads to a lot of challenges that managers face in the tech sector. One of the things we were thinking about is managers should think about the ways to create longer term metrics for their companies. In fact, I could think about a couple of very large companies uh, that have now created efforts to try to say, can we think better about, about concepts more analogous to the, the real net present value of a change that they're making and bake that into an experiment, right? The um, uh, second thing we talk about a lot in the book and that we have been thinking about that motivated us to write the book is um, that uh, kind of similar to having short run outcomes, companies sometimes have very narrow set of outcomes, right? Where you're thinking about clicks, but you're not thinking about uh, discrimination, you're not thinking about customer sentiment, you're not thinking about impact on other products enough. Um, so having a broader set of metrics that you're using. So when we started thinking about this, we came to the conclusion that there are a lot of managerial questions 
that we wanted MBA students and we wanted companies to be thinking about when they're trying to run experiments. So in some sense, the goal of the book was, um, there were multiple goals. The first was trying to help people get an appreciation of the value of experiments. Um, that's also one of the core goals that I had in creating this course from data to decisions. Um, help people understand how and where experiments could be used. Uh, the second part is what are some of the key design choices that should require managerial input? Like what are the outcomes you care about? Are you trying to understand a mechanism or a specific effect size? Are you thinking about generalizing this insight to somewhere else? If, if so, uh, what are some of the challenges involved there? Right? So kind of the design choices, and then how do you interpret this and bake it into a managerial decision at the end? And while there have been lots of technical guides on experimentation, we thought that there was a, a real, uh, uh, there was a there was a real hole in trying to understand how managers should think about going from an experiment to a managerial decision. And that's what motivated the book. In the book, we walk through essentially one third uh, behavioral experiments in government, one third uh, tech experiments, and one third sort of putting it all together to get to uh, bigger experiments uh, throughout society. Was there something for you personally that drove this or was it just curiosity, like you said, once you started looking at platforms? What was that thing that made it click for you that like, wait, there could be discrimination here? I went to BU for grad school. So I grew up in New York, so I'm like a Yankees fan. So there's a little bit of a uh, tension there. Uh, but outside of that, I loved it and had a great experience. Um, I, at the time, I'd actually started off thinking about economic theory and also healthcare were two areas that I'd been interested in. Um, when I started thinking about economic theory, the thing that got me interested in tech more broadly was information. I started thinking about kind of rating systems. And actually, the first paper I'd done uh, was with um, or my grad school uh, friends, John Smith. We had written a paper on the impact of US News College ratings. And actually, there, we were thinking about this behavioral component of it. So people respond to ratings. But what we found is that a lot of the response was just based on how salient you make the information to people. Um, so to give a concrete example of the type of thing we looked at, um, over time, US News has expanded the number of schools they ranked. So um, we looked at this change in the mid 90s where they used to rank uh, 1 to 25, then 26 through 50 were listed alphabetically but you have the methodology next to the ranking. So if anybody really wanted to do the math, and this is a pretty big decision, um, you, you could just do the math. But we found that, uh, that the ranking started to matter a lot more after they switched 26 through 50 from being alphabetical to being rank order. Um, once we saw that, we thought, well, it doesn't seem that it's just information people are responding to. It's information, but also the way that you're designing this and the way that you're uh, providing that information back to people. And that paper kind of got me thinking about the fact that there are probably a lot of design choices that platforms make and um, you know, media outlets make about what, how to aggregate information and get it back to people. It was at HBS, my first year here, that I started thinking about Airbnb and the big role that these platforms had the potential to play in society, even though they were only starting to have uh, a big role at the time. And there I started thinking about some of the questions that people really seem to be missing in practice and also in research, right? So while there had been documentation of research, the question of how these design choices were going to affect the level of discrimination uh, had it been a big topic at the time. And I thought that it was something that uh, economics had the potential to go um, really help to shed light into, both documenting the issue and helping to provide frameworks for managers and for researchers. I like how throughout your work, um, obviously you have all of the skills and expertise to understand the math, um, but you're thinking beyond to the implications. Like what are the implications for the people that are sort of feeding this data and math and what are the implications for the people interpreting it. Um, it's sort of what we talk about a lot in the digital initiative of, of having this multidisciplinary approach uh, to the problems we face. Yeah, the thing that really gets me excited about these questions is the possibility of helping to affect change at the end of everything. Yeah, and that's, um, people often ask this question about, you know, what does academia do? It's an interesting question about what the role of research is um, in organizations and in helping to affect practice. I think there are to some extent different views on this and uh, different emphasis on this across disciplines and across areas. Um, when I was a grad student, I was in an economics department. And at the time, you know, then on the 
I have been thinking about economic departments, hadn't really been thinking about business schools as much. And it was when I was on, when I was looking for a job that I really started exploring business schools. And one thing that excites me about business schools is the opportunity to both think about how is research affecting uh, future research and kind of what the academic insights are, but also thinking about what the possibility is to help shape practice uh, through research, through transla translational materials, and through developing uh, pedagogy and teaching in an MBA classroom. So, you know, before we, we started this interview, we were talking about your family, you recently had um, a third child. And, you know, I am curious, we were talking about this internally, sort of, you know, is there a way in which um, being a parent has influenced the way you think about your work, especially with regard to this question around its impact on, on practice and impact on society? I do think about wanting to uh, address questions. And when I see a problem in the world where I think economics and data could have an impact, I want to be able to look back and say, when I thought that I could do something, that I tried. And we may not have had uh, a, the big change. Um, there may be a lot left to do. But um, I sort of reflect back and say, all right, uh, we saw this problem. We tried to study it. We tried to help develop frameworks for managers who want to solve it. And that is something that excites me. And it's something that I do sort of think about sometimes. So uh, would love to hear you actually just talk a little bit about what you've observed, you know, over your your time at HBS and as you, you know, have been talking with these companies right over the past decade or so. Um, I think we've seen the conversation evolve. That's one of the reasons we're doing this project. Um, we've seen the conversation evolve in the tech sector about, you know, equality and equity and discrimination. So would love your reflections on where we are today. I've been at HBS since 2011. And one thing that struck me is that the way that uh, the classroom talks about race and the way that businesses are thinking about race has evolved. You can think about it even in the context of the Airbnb work, but I think that this is a broader phenomenon. Uh, when I first started teaching days on uh, Airbnb and on discrimination and platforms, you would spend a lot of time uh, thinking about just, is this something that companies should be uh, thinking about? And I would say that there's been a little bit of a shift toward people being more proactive and thinking about what should we be doing about this rather than should we be doing something about this. And I think that's true in a lot of areas of the business sector. I don't want to say it's universally true either across companies or across problems because I don't know and just hard to say there are a lot of problems that companies are grappling with. But I will say that both in the context of platform design, uh, companies have become a lot more receptive to saying, you know, we should get out in front of this. We should try to make changes. We should try to create an inclusive ecosystem. So uh, when I think about the challenges that society is facing in a bunch of domains, and especially around race, around discrimination, um, it, it does seem, at least within the narrow corner of the world, that. Uh, that I've been involved in, so kind of like the tech sector and platform design, that there has been a shift. And one bright spot is that there's more attention that companies are, are paying to these issues and um, more efforts to try to create platforms and create workplaces that are going to be productive, positive, and inclusive. I think you're absolutely right that just in, you know, business generally, there's been a real evolution. Um, and I've seen it definitely outside the tech sector as well. I think, you know, it's, um, I think there's variation, of course, but and that, that's one reason I actually think um, work like yours is so important, because I think it is helping shift the conversation away from business leaders saying, okay, well, what, what do I do? How do I just not discriminate? Or how do I be sort of more gender inclusive or um, racially inclusive or whatever, but to say, oh, okay, how do I develop a way of thinking about these issues, right? How do I develop, you know, build into kind of the processes that we engage in every day, you know, experimentation and looking at our data and um, actually just incorporating this as part of how we think about our work, which is quite different from just like, what are the, you know, things that I need to do to comply with regulation or, you know, what are the things that I need to sort of not do? What's like the list of no-nos, right? Which I think for so long has been the way that businesses have approach these issues. And I think, you know, we've seen the limitations of that kind of, um, you know, compliance oriented approach. And so I think this work that helps people understand a some of the mechanisms, right, experiments can help you understand, well, like, why is that outcome happening, you know, which gives you a lot more insight. And then also just kind of this shift to, okay, you know, how do we bake into the way that we think about things, the way that we set up hiring, or the way that, you know, we actually design products, um, 
the right questions to ask and the right um, kind of analyses to do, which I think that's, I am optimistic about that, that, that shift um, in, in, in how companies think about it as well. Mike, do you have uh, any suggested resources for the people watching this that might, uh, they might dig into and learn more about this topic? There's a lot of great work in the area. So one book that kind of predated uh, the platform design literature um, is a book by Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler called Nudge. And in that book, they start to think about the role that behavioral economics and framing of decisions plays in the outcomes um, in a lot of different areas. Like you can think about 401k decisions. And that book uh, influences the way that I've thought about um, both about platform design and also about the role experiments could play in organizations. Even though those weren't central topics in the book, uh, I think that's a useful resource for anybody looking to get into the area. For people that are thinking about discrimination and hiring processes, I think What Works by Iris Bonet is a great resource for uh, people who wanna learn where that literature is. And for people interested in algorithms and the potential for algorithmic bias. A recent book um, called The Ethical Algorithm uh, provides a great overview of where the literature is and what we know and don't know about the area so far. Mike, thanks for joining us today. Yes, thank you for joining us, Mike. It's been a really fascinating conversation. Thanks, Colleen. Thanks, Dave. That's a wrap on the interview, but the conversation continues. And we want to hear from you. Send your questions, comments, and ideas to justdigital at hbs.edu. You've been watching Pathways to a Just Digital Future, an investigative project that aims to better understand and address inequality in tech. This program was produced by the Harvard Business School Digital and Gender Initiatives. Our team includes Ethiopia Almaty and my cat, Tanya Flint. One more time, Liz Sarley. Thomas Jamie Dayo. I'm Dave Homa. And I'm Colleen Ammerman. Thanks for hanging out with us. Keep exploring at justdigital.hbs.edu.